Let us continue righteous jihad on crap driving and throw a crap driver on the floor this afternoon. Stab it through the heart with a pointy stick and watch it exsanguinate all over the floor. Or at least teach a few people how to stop in an emergency. I'm John Cadogan from autoexpert.com.au, the place where Aussie new car buyers save thousands off their next new cars. Hit me up on the website for that. Now, I reckon driving's like this. Pulling out from the curb is, to a degree, optional. You can choose not to do it, okay? But once you've done it, stopping is kind of mandatory, right? It's like flying. Most landings when you fly are uneventful. So are most stops in a car. But every now and again, you have to kind of land with your left engine on fire and no concrete indication that the landing gear has actually deployed. Hmm, that's bad. Same with driving, you know, some of those stops, sooner or later, if you drive a car, you are going to have to perform an emergency stop. And it is a very bad idea to wing it. It's a very bad idea to practice your first emergency stop during your very first emergency. I don't think you'd get on a plane if Qantas trained its pilots that way. So why don't we think about emergency stopping and maybe stacking the deck in our favour for a positive outcome that day when that actually happens to you. You've got these critical incidents, maybe they turn into disasters and maybe they don't. But if you were to swim back upstream in the time domain, what you'd see is a whole bunch of contributing factors and if you could maybe jump out of the time domain and just sideline one or more of those key contributing factors, you could turn an emergency into a not even a memorable event. You could completely decriticalize it, if that's a word, and wouldn't that be happy if you could do it? What you've really got to do is figure out what those factors are, take them out of play all the time, thereby stacking the deck in your favour because inconveniently, time only goes in the one direction. So why don't we do that? If we go way back upstream, the first thing you've got to do, and I've got four of these things today, the first thing is pump up your damn tyres because here in Australia, at least, the air at the servo is free and yet not nearly enough people avail themselves of it nearly frequently enough. You know, every second time you fill up your car, or at least once a fortnight, you should check your tyre pressures. And if you're unsure about how much pressure to put in down there, just have a look inside the driver's door frame. There's a tyre placard in there, and it spells it out in great detail. Now, if you've got the only car in the universe without a tyre placard, and it's a conventional sort of car, you could ring the manufacturer and ask them, or you could just do this. 32 to 36 PSI for your average car running a range of average passenger tyres. If you've got that in all four of those tyres, you will stack the deck in your favour. Inconveniently, if one of those tyres is even a little bit deflated, what you'll notice is dynamic instability, which is a euphemism for the car's going to zig or zag one way violently, inconveniently, in the middle of your emergency, making it even more interesting and this is of course exactly what you do not want in this situation so the free air at the servo is the number one way to turn this frown of emergency braking upside down cut a little bit out of your stopping distance and make things as stable as they can be Number two with a bullet is drive the most modern car you can afford to drive and make sure it's got all of that high-tech brake hardware. The ABS, the EBA, the EBD, all of that stuff, those acronyms that only make sense if you're a proper car nerd or an engineer. They all matter. They really matter. So let's pull over just up here and talk about that. I get the nostalgia trip about old cars, I really do. But if you're one of these people who tells yourself that old cars are objectively better than new ones, then you really need to stop smoking crack. Here's why. 
So about a billion years ago, shortly after the musket replaced the broadsword in terms of being the preferred tool of conflict resolution once diplomacy had failed, the rear brakes on old cars just didn't work very well. And that was because available technology meant there was a proportioning valve in the centre of the car and that limited the work that the rear brakes could do. They did it because in a panic stop, the front brakes would be the first to lock in every case. It's always bad when the rear wheels lock because you end up pirouetting down the road and encountering, probably, an obstacle sideways. If you're going to run off and have a crash, trust me, much better off to do it in a more or less frontal direction. And that's what the proportioning valve achieved. But then later on, at about the time of the advent of ABS, we had electronic brake force distribution and what that basically meant was these rear brakes were suddenly contributing all that they could to the stopping process. And then a bunch of brainiacs in the car industry solved another big braking problem, which was that during an emergency, a significant number of drivers simply failed to press the brake pedal hard enough to invoke an emergency stop. So they invented emergency brake assist, which has a look at how fast you're pressing the brake pedal, not how hard, how fast, and above a certain speed of depression threshold, the system autonomously increases the brake line pressure to deliver a full tilt emergency stop. It's an absolutely brilliant system. A bunch of very talented brainiacs have saved countless lives, and I mean countless lives with their smart brake technology. They've basically de-skilled almost totally the emergency stopping process. But there are still things you can do to put risk even further in the background. So let's talk about them now and let's start with vision and how you use your vision. Most people don't look nearly far enough ahead when they drive a car. They're fixated in the middle distance, sometimes even closer than that, and they fail, therefore, to buy themselves enough time when a critical situation is able to be perceived in the distance and they just don't see it. And that's kind of a tragedy. So the number one thing you've got to do there is lift your vision. But in Australia, we drive typically very long distances from time to time on the open road, and that means that we also have to guard against fatigue. And fatigue has this odd capacity to, to lull you into inaction. Even when you see something in, you know, unfolding in front of you, it takes a while to get back into gear mentally. So you've got to guard against that as well. You've got to remain mentally engaged with the driving process if you want to take this risk off the table. They're the two things you basically got to do. Now, if you're looking a little bit further ahead and you manage to buy yourself a seemingly trivial amount of time, let's say four seconds, four seconds at 100 k's an hour, that's more than 100 meters of additional stopping distance that you've just bought yourself. You know, it's an incredible amount. The difference between a non-event from a critical incident point of view and a dirty big smash that you could be involved in. So, you know, there are other activities in life where four seconds goes by in a heartbeat and you'll never even remember it. If it all goes horribly wrong on the road, those four seconds will play over and over and over again in your imagination. And the only problem with that is you'll never be able to come up with a different ending. Let's talk about how you're going to act when your spider sense goes off. You know, you see something, it's not a critical incident, but it could turn into one. You know, just something that looks a bit dodgy down there in the distance. What are you going to do? Well, the first thing I'd suggest you do is get your foot off the gas take it off now you know because if you're steaming down the road at 110 on the freeway and you take your foot off the gas while you're sorting out what's going on down there you know there might be a tradie on the side of the road you might have spotted what looks like an animal in the bushes at the side maybe a kamikaze kangaroo is about to try and take you out who knows maybe a truck is approaching from the side and you can't tell if it's going to honor its give way obligations any of these things could go bad right so if you get off the gas and you slow down 
just because you're not powering ahead anymore, if you get down to 100 k's an hour from 110, it doesn't seem like a big difference, but it's a huge difference in stopping, right? Because energy is proportional to the square of your speed, and that means that stopping distance is proportional to the square of your speed. If you're not a horrible maths nerd or something, that just means that small differences in speed make big differences to stopping distance. You're essentially buying yourself 20% discount on the stopping distance if you can get down from 110 to 100 just by slowing down gradually while you're sorting out what's going on down there. And because you've had a lift off the gas while you're sorting this out, how about you get your foot and move it across, put it above the brake pedal. That might buy you another, I don't know, half a second. Let's say that's all it is. If it's half a second, you might think, well, that's trivial. At 100 k's an hour, half a second is about 14 meters. That's three and a half car lengths. The difference between a near miss and a horrible life-changing smash. And I'd suggest that there are many of these incidents where if you could buy yourself, you could go back in time and buy yourself that three and a half car lengths, you absolutely would. You'd sell anything to be able to do that. So that's a neat trick as well. And then if your spider sense keeps going off and it looks really bad, the instant you decide, holy shit Batman, this is an emergency, then my strong advice to you is to smash the brake pedal as hard as you can. Stomp it into the floor. Do not be afraid of breaking it or causing any damage whatsoever. A lot of people are very timid about this. I urge you not to be. I'm assuming you're driving one of these modern cars with anti-lock brakes and all the other high-tech brake hardware and software. If you are, that is absolutely the best course of action. Just smash the brake pedal and wait for the scenery to stop moving. And good safety tip, keep looking where you want the car to go because as you slow down and as you approach the pointy end of whatever this critical incident is there may be an opportunity to swerve there are some situations where that is absolutely a bad idea and some situations where it's absolutely essential we'll get into that next week if you like but let's just say you got to leave your options open and whatever you do look where you want the car to go we covered that off earlier too do not look at the truck if you want to avoid the truck look at the gap because you know cars go where you look particularly in emergencies where logic just gets thrown out the window and you are totally reactive you know your body's flooded with stress hormones cortisol and noradrenaline your amygdala takes over there's no logic in any in any of this it's just reactivity so keep looking where you want to go as comforting as it may be to live in a world where you think technology has basically made emergency braking an autonomous activity where you don't really have to take part I'd suggest there are a lot of things you can do to slash your stopping distance and reduce danger to not only yourself but the people in the car with you that you care about and also the people around you that you do owe this debt of responsibility to because we're all part of the same society. We're not talking about Formula One driving skills here, are we? We're talking about lifting your vision, checking your tyre pressures, moving your foot, and when it all goes wrong, belting the brake pedal. And all of this stuff buys you time and stopping distance, and it might save your neck or someone else's. Who knows, you might be able to use some of these tips and just incrementally improve the caliber of the driving gene pool around you. We can live in hope. I'm John Cadogan. Thanks for your interest. I'll talk to you next week.